Now, I think if God has done anything for you this week, you ought to throw your hands up in there and praise Him like you lost your mind. Come on. Has He done anything for you? You ought to lift your voice to Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Somebody said, all you do is praise Him. Is there anything else to do? I didn't know there's anything else to do. The Bible said, let everything that have breath. Praise the Lord. Praise you the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. I do want to say tonight how how honored we are, how happy we are to have all of our visiting ministers here at uh, Passing the Torch 2013. If you are a minister here with us tonight, we would love for you to stand. We want to give honor to you. All of our ministers that are here tonight, would you please stand? Hallelujah. Let's give them, let's give them a wonderful applause. We honor our ministers. I believe it's Brother Serrano. So glad he's with us tonight. God bless you. Brother, brother, uh, br brother Miguel and his family all the way from out in the panhandle of Oklahoma. We love them. So glad they're here tonight. Praise God. Praise God. Brother and Sister Charles from Garden City. And I've already got started and I'm going to forget somebody and I don't want to do that. Brother and Sister Watts, all the way from Dalhart, Texas. Brother Wardwell from Indiana, somewhere in Indiana, around Indianapolis, I know that. Recently took a church, wonderful man of God. So glad he's with us here at the Torch 2013. We want to invite all of you visiting ministers and your families to Christian Growth Center following the service tonight. We have prepared... Uh, food for you, time of fellowship. It's very easy to get to. It's 1906 Hudson Avenue. And uh, we want you all to come. Now, if you don't come, I'm praying that God will keep you up all night with indigestion. And that if you do come, he'll heal the indigestion. No, I'm kidding. Praise God. We love you. We're glad you're here. We love our ministers. Praise the Lord. Tonight is a special night. It's, a, it's an ordination night. Tonight it is the will of the Spirit that uh, these men of God that have, have proven their ministry and their families will be ordained. And I can think of no greater man of God that exemplifies the power of God's anointing and the commitment to this call. My wife and I were talking about this a few months ago. If there, were, if there was one word that I could use to define Bishop Nathaniel Wilson, my definition, that one word would be obedience. I don't know of a man that has signified an example to me and modeled to me in my life more than Bishop Wilson, the importance and the power of obeying the voice of God in your life. He's not only obedient to men, he goes beyond that. He is obedient to God and his faithfulness to the doctrines and the revelations that God has given him. And we're so honored to have Bishop Wilson with us tonight. Christian Girl Center, this is my pastor. When my father died, I panicked because I have to have a voice of God in my life. I cannot preach to others that they have to be in submission to a man of God if I do not example that. And I appreciate his commitment to being that voice in my life. And I'm so honored that he's here. I could take a lot of time. I could tell you that the first time I heard Bishop Nathaniel Wilson preach. I was 15 years old. He doesn't even know this. He was the Harvest Time director. 
at that time they were trying their best to get me to go to Gateway Bible College and he preached a harvest time deal at that concert that night and I was there and the anointing touched my heart and I thought to myself man Sorry, <laughs> but that was the truth. And uh, um, then from there, he came and preached a camp meeting in 1981, Kansas. My mother is here. She would remember this. I never forgot one message that he preached there. That was the anointing that was there. It was like God took a hot iron and branded those messages into my spirit. I remember them so much. I could tell you every one of them. I won't because I don't want to take the time. I just know that God has placed him in my life and in our lives. And I'm so glad that he has uh, committed to come and be with us tonight. I believe that God has a word to, from, for him to give to us. I really do. And so without further ado, I want you to stand. I want us all to lift our hands and I want us to give God high praise as Bishop Nathaniel Wilson comes to minister the word of the Lord. Come on, let's give him a high praise. Thank you, Brother Elder. I love you. Oh, let's praise him tonight. He's worthy. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Brother Elder, it's an honor to be here with all of you. There is nowhere in the world that I wish that I was at more than I'm happy to be where I am. There's nobody I wish I could meet tonight more than meeting you. I have no ambition to use this as a stepping stone to get somewhere in the world. I'm glad I'm where I'm at in the world. I'm a child of God. I'm with the people of God. Amen. Amen. And <clears throat> preaching the gospel and living for God and being a part of God's people is the highest honor on earth. And one day that's going to be revealed in ways that none of us have yet seen revealed. The sons of God will be revealed to the world in a way they've never been revealed. I'm glad I'm part of it. How about you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm thankful for this conference. I'm thankful for... I'm thankful for the sponsors and this church. Christian Growth Center, all the ministers that are here tonight, it's an honor to be here with you. And <clears throat> all of the precious saints of God, what a great time we're having. And there has been a blessing of God on each service so far. Amen. Amen. And um, thank God for the ministry of the word last night. Thank God for the ministry of the word this morning. I feel like God has given me personal answers that I was looking for. Uh, before I got here in the Holy Ghost if you just get in the Holy Ghost when the man of God invites you to get in the Holy Ghost God will do great things it don't matter what everybody else is doing just get in the Holy Ghost amen amen so thank you for the invitation and thank you um, for coming tonight this is a special night there will be some brethren ordained tonight on an ordination service, there's a lot of things that could be preached. There are many facets to ministry. And that very fact can become a roadblock to people actually getting ever to the bottom of what's the most important thing in ministry. So I'm, I'm going to preach to you tonight what I feel like has been the most important thing in ministry in 
my experience and seeing the experience of others and of course in studying the word of God. So I want to preach to you tonight for a little while on the subject of the profile of a prophet. The profile of a prophet. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 to preach the word. That was one of the texts I gave the screen man tonight, but really that's, only, that's all I want out of that verse right now is just preach the word. My primary text is in Isaiah chapter 6. Even if you say, I know that chapter, I know those verses, would you follow with me in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 1? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord setting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then here's Isaiah's response. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. So I want to preach to you for a little while tonight on a biblical profile of what a prophet is, because I think that's the most, I think that's the core of what kind of ministry it's going to take in this last day to impact our world the way it needs to be impacted. I think the understanding or the lack thereof is becoming an increasingly serious and critical problem in the apostolic movement as, rest, as well as in the rest of the world. And so I want to preach it tonight. I feel, like, I feel like this service is bigger than this place. In the spirit, in the spirit, I feel like God is doing something here tonight. This isn't melodrama. This is the truth. I feel like God wants to unleash something here tonight that reverberates throughout our, cities, our cities and our ministries and beyond us to others. And it's that supernatural element that you and I have got to have to be able to truly do the work of God. And I want that, I want that supernatural element <clears throat> prophetic anointing to come in this place tonight to open our eyes with revelation that when we walk out we can say surely God has revealed himself to us in this place would you pray again with me right now that God would touch us in the next little bit come on pray out loud lift your hands let's believe the Lord amen 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 Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. 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 Turn around and shake hands with somebody. Greet them in Jesus' name, and you may be seated. Amen. If I was preaching twice, in this conference I would first preach this that we're preaching here especially if it was 
connected as it is tonight to an ordination service. Then, to those who are transitioning from leadership roles and to those who are transitioning into leadership roles, I would preach another message and I would entitle it, The Anointing of Coming Prophets by Going Prophets. But we don't have time to preach that tonight. I, I don't know of anything that I've preached in a long time that I feel as deeply about as what I'm preaching tonight, or at least not more deeply than what I'm preaching tonight. And I feel a, a deep sense of urgency about this. Um, and I feel a little bit of guilt about this tonight. I look back in my ministry and while I was praying and seeking God the last few days, God actually gave me this three or four or five months ago for this service tonight. And then I have studied and prayed since then to flesh it out the way that he wanted it to be fleshed out. And um, it has brought a certain amount of guilt to me uh, on more than one occasion of praying and seeking God and, and saying, God, I don't feel like I personally have done this as well I should have done it. And the question that I ask myself is, what I'm preaching tonight, have I personally conveyed this through the years? I'm afraid that there have been times that I have not. Not that I was, I don't think I was afraid to convey it. I look back and I think I was a bit too respectful of other people's privacy or their right to remain in spiritual ignorance. And I look back at people and thought of people that I have had the privilege to have some input into their ministry. And I have reviewed the methodology that I used and tried to help them and I have come to the conclusion that on more than one of them I waited too long for them to ask the right questions and because they never asked the right questions the opportunity never opened up to give them revelation that would transform their lives and so the guilt is I feel like I should have just butted into their lives and I don't know exactly how all of that works. I know we're all free moral agents. Uh, and I certainly <clears throat> don't want to be coercive in any way. But with that said, tonight I feel to preach this with its full weight. And let the fullness of it lean against our spirits tonight. So when you look at our Second Timothy text to preach the word, when you start, it seems like a fairly straightforward proposition. Preach the word. And we hear that, and we'll probably hear it tonight in ordination service after ordination service. And the little phrase seems to be self-explanatory, that uh, it's not hard to figure out what he means when he says preach the word. But as many of you know, like many things that have to do with God, the more you look at it, the bigger it gets, and you realize there's much more to it. And when preaching the word is coupled with all that that entails, it ends up to be a very big subject. And so when we look at this, we begin to see that preaching the word, if we, if we seek uh, with seriousness with gravity to see what the word has to say about what all is involved in preaching the word and biblically what does that mean to preach the word is it just to speak something that we know or is there more to it and and of course that jumps you back into uh, pursuit of the subject that is my title tonight the profile of a biblical prophet and what does it begin with and I think the first thing tonight uh, and I'm still in my introduction so you kind of know where we're going here 
I think the first thing tonight that we have to understand is that <clears throat> although there are evangelical and denominal voices that would tell you that the prophetic element of the church as found in the Bible uh, closed with the writing of the Bible or with the apostolic age and that all such attempts to transfer into the present day in which you and I are in right now anything out of the Bible in terms of how they preach the word is something that uh, is unnecessary and uh, of course we don't agree with that at all the same people that would say that and I could call the names of theologians that do say that they are people who say that you can't receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues because that also closed with the apostolic age but <clears throat> unfortunately for them and fortunately for me they've come too late because I know what I got when I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues hey by it and the only reason they might call that some kind of crutch for a weak person is because they simply don't know what it's like to receive the Holy Ghost and they are speaking out of ignorance so, and so I will be kind to them they may have a lot of degrees and all that but brother that doesn't replace a relationship with Jesus Christ and a dynamic experience of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and you will speak in tongues when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and there's no alternative to that that's how it happened in the Bible and who are you that have come up with a better idea than the Bible oh we ought to just we ought to just we're Pentecostal we ought to just stand up and clap our hands for a moment and thank God for the revelation of the truth and the Word of God and so if there's anything that is true of God's people oh, there's so much to preach the idea of God's people actually where they are identified as a people starts with Moses and the Exodus out of Egypt and when they get to Mount Sinai and God gives them the law which is a constitution a government that's what makes a people a people is that they have some form of government and, are, and have an identity uh, by the time they get there one of the very first things we see is the spirit of prophecy comes upon Moses and the Bible identifies him in the book of Numbers as the spirit of the Lord being upon him the anointing of the Lord being upon him and that there is a prophetic touch upon him and from that the people of God because of the touch of the spirit upon them become known as a prophetic people that is not changed the church is unique it is different than uh, the Elks Club or the Owls Club or the or the uh, Boars Club or the Teddy Bears Club or whatever else you got out there you name yours after animals I'll name mine after mine after Jesus yeah. hallelujah but what we're in what we're in is a prophetic thing when you get the Holy Ghost it's it's not something that's just cognitive that you you are sent to follow the rules of the club and pay your dues this is this is a this is a dynamic thing in which the spirit of prophecy rests upon each of us that's what the Holy Ghost is is the spirit of prophecy the Bible calls it that in the book of Revelation and so the Holy Ghost uh, is the spirit of prophecy and we're prophetic people without getting into a long of detail about what it means to be a prophetic people to be a prophetic people the idea of prophetic is that it is forward-looking and it, it, it is a people uh, because it is forward-looking it means it's a people with destiny because when you look forward there's something to look forward to and so the church is a people of destiny the people of God are a people of destiny therefore for others history has no particular meaning but for us history has meaning because we are a people of destiny and we are placed into the world the world does not know itself and it cannot know itself because it's in darkness uh, 
but the people of God have received revelation from outside of the world and we tell the world about itself that's what the mission of a prophetic people is is to tell the world about itself and then give it solutions to its problems uh, and that's why whether the world recognizes it or not the church is the most important thing in the world uh, because it's the only thing that can tell the world uh, what it needs uh, and the great good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ aren't you glad you're in the church tonight Oh, let's praise him. Amen. Amen. And so in the church, the, the first and foremost duty in a local situation or in a broader situation is that that church, that group, that fellowship has prophetic leadership because it is the prophetic leadership that gives meaning to the teaching and gives meaning to the administration and gives meaning to the Shema and to teaching our children if the prophetic is gone then everything else immediately loses the context in which its meaning is found the prophetic is the spirit of God that is resident in and on the people of God and the way the people of God are led and have always been led is by prophetically anointed individuals who get the mind of God and and impart the mind of God and impart the feelings of God and impart the word of God that's prophetic ministry and that is essential if we are to continue you cannot create enough uh, frameworks and enough infrastructure to ignore what I'm preaching tonight and that thing keep going on and be Holy Ghost filled and be the prophetic people of God. At some point, it will it will warp. It will it will evolve into something else. Unless at the core of it there is an anointed prophetic ministry. I want to drive home the importance of this before I talk about it. That without this, we are as lost as a ball in high weeds. We have to have the touch of prophetic ministry. And if we don't have the touch of prophetic ministry, then we lose our direction, our identity, and our impetus. Oh, come on. Help me preach tonight. Let's love him again. And so I want to look at the prophet in four ways tonight. The first is I want to look at the prophet as a message bearer. This is actually the part of being a prophet that's probably the best known. He's an emissary. He's an ambassador. He's an agent. All of these words can be biblically applied to a prophet. He's a messenger. He's an envoy. He brings all of this syn synonymous terms to the table. And as such, he has a call to be a prophet. The call that I read to you tonight in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 8 or 9 is generally accepted by Bible students as paradigmatic of a call to prophethood. In other words, what you read about Isaiah applies to everybody that's called to be a prophet. That's the, that's the model of how prophets are called. Now you may think tonight so far that this is pretty basic perhaps so I called a friend of mine today to validate and verify that I was telling this story right tonight 
But it exemplifies part of why I feel such an impetus to preach this. A preacher friend of mine who is well known received a phone call this year about someone who was starting a training school for apostolic preachers and he asked my friend if he would help teach in this school and he said well tell me about your school and what you're doing he said well a lot of it will do online maybe all of it I don't know and he said this is primarily for preachers this is all apostolic people this is primarily for preachers who are not called preachers who have not ever received a specific call and he said I'd like for you to teach in this school this is the ones we're working with preachers who do not feel like that they had a call and my friend said well I I don't I don't think I could teach in that because I don't think there is any such thing as an apostolic preacher that's not called and if you got people that are preaching that confess that they've never been called then you've got big problems and the guy went on to explain to him I'm sure he's a good man I don't know him but I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt don't have any reason not to but he said well I talked to so-and-so who is a leading figure in the apostolic movement that every probably everybody in here most everybody in here would know the name if I called it even if you don't know him and he said I talked to him about this and he was for it and he said he told me he said well you know brother I wasn't really called I just offered myself to the Lord and here I am and if I was in conversation with him and all of the dynamics of the conversation was in the right place maybe my response would be that's why we're in the kind of trouble we're in because you never got called in the first place and you think you know stuff you don't know because the intellectual mind thinks it knows everything and when it comes to what I'm talking about the intellectual mind don't know anything I'm not trying to impress you. I'm trying to preach to you tonight that when this is lost, when this element is gone, you can kiss it goodbye. And so my friend said, well, I, I, won't, I won't be teaching for you. He said, I can't, I can't do that. I don't even know. I, that's a language I don't even understand. And he said, well, we're going to educate them into being a preacher. But I'm going to tell you that somebody is woefully short on understanding. And it's manifesting itself in the apostolic movement. And so, the Hebrew word for prophet is navi. N-A-V-I would be the transliteration from the Hebrew. That is the word for prophet. If it's a woman, it's naviah. N A V I A H. And Nave means to call. So you can't have a prophetic ministry if you rip the meaning out of the word that's used to describe what that preacher is. It starts with the literal meaning to call and theologians have fussed about which side that means does it mean that it's for God to call or does it mean the one who is called and the truth is it by intent means both it is that a man or woman receives a call and then they respond to the call as the called and when that element's gone can't spend a lot of time here tonight but when that element is gone then the apostolic church is producing mental health professionals rather than the apostolic dynamic that cannot be encased 
or structured or fit into a human contrivance of any kind but defies all of them and that's a prophetic ministry and it is exactly that quality of prophetic ministry that makes people shake their head and say if we can't get it in a box uh, then maybe we don't need it but I'm telling you everything you've got in your box is not enough you're going to have to find a place to understand what I'm preaching tonight if you're going to survive uh, as the people of God because there are prophetic people and the word prophet comes from the word to call God has called us out ecclesia Iglesia, called out ones. I mean, that's so basic. How are we missing that? Well, we're not at passing the torch. We believe that. And that's the ground we're standing on tonight. And the purest meaning you can get for Nave is one who has been called out by God to call out. One who has been called out by God to call out. And so he's first and foremost a messenger. This is why repeatedly it's thus saith the word of the Lord. This was not just a biblical figure of speech. It is a familiar figure of speech in the Middle East. And it was a figure of speech used when a message was being delivered by a royal messenger, ambassador, envoy, embass, uh, embassy personnel that was bringing a political message from one kingdom to another. And they were taking this message from one throne room to another throne room. And so there are three words associated with a prophet in the Old Testament, which are enlightening to us and thus brings us to our text in Isaiah 6 where we see along with many other places the phrase the word of the Lord let me take just a little time here tonight the word for word of the Lord is devar d-a-v-a-r it is the subject matter of prophets it is the second most used phrase in the Old Testament the word of the Lord it's not the word usually associated with priests the word associated with priests is Torah and it's not the word that's usually associated with sages the word that's usually associated with sages is counsel Torah counsel but with a prophetic ministry it is devar the word of the Lord and because it is so prominent we need tonight an understanding of what this word means because the Bible says the word of the Lord came to so and so better translation would be the word of the Lord occurred to so and so the truth of the matter is, is English has no equivalent word to transmit the weight of the meaning of devar. The scope of devar goes beyond our word, word, the word of the Lord. It's more than what was spoken or written or heard or read. The word of the Lord. I'm preaching the word of the Lord tonight. It's more than all of that. It's not just simply a transference of information. It's an event that happens to the prophet. The word of the Lord happens to the prophet before it goes out of the prophet. It is encountered. The word of the Lord is encountered. It's seen. It's experienced. You can see this without a lot of elaboration on it in the life of Hosea, where to encounter the word of the Lord 
was life changing. His life, the prophet, the prophetic anointing is, is a type of the incarnation of Jesus Christ where the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And with Old Testament prophets, think while I'm doing this, of the present charismatic trend in the apostolic movement to sit on a stool, no more yelling, no more sweating, no more pulpit pounding, no more emotion, but sit on a stool with your ripped jeans and be cool Joe and break the word to people intellectually while they eat their donut and drink their coffee. I'm not beating on people tonight. I'm just saying that is indicative of the ignorance of what goes on with a prophetic people. Where a prophetic people, the word of the Lord is not something that is just intellectually passed from one to the other, but rather it is something that the prophetic word speaker, the prophet, has encountered and it has it has transformed him. And he, it's an experience and and he has seen something in that word and so the word of the Lord comes to Hosea and the remainder of chapter 1 in Hosea describes his life forever modified by this encounter it impacts his marriage it impacts him having three children God's word is not only to Hosea it is through Hosea it is much more than a relay of information for a few minutes in the pulpit being bearer, you that are getting ordained and all of us, being bearer of the word of the Lord changed Hosea's entire life, his marriage, his past understandings, his present plans, his future aspirations, all become moot, as we'll see in a minute, when one becomes a bearer in a city or in a place or in a family of the word of God. And when this happens, the second word that comes with being a prophet that is seen repeatedly in the Bible is kazon, K-H-A-Z-O-N, which is Hebrew for vision and the Bible uniquely says of Amos, in Amos 1 and 1, the word of the Lord came to him, which he saw. It doesn't say it's what he heard. It says it's what he saw. And this word, kazon, or vision, is another key term in the prophetic vocabulary of the Bible it is messengers not only hear but they have visions they see it is a visualization of something supernatural there are people who would say that's just the Old Testament but that's not so the book of Acts is filled with visions in fact it's got a lot more visionary experience than it does what we call exegetical preaching and the Bible says in John 5 19 of Jesus uh, Jesus himself says I don't do nothing except what the Father showeth me that's a prophetic ministry that moves and people say why did he do it how did he know to do that because the Spirit showed it to him and when he starts he already sees that thing in its completed ideal form every miracle Jesus ever did he saw that person not only crippled but he saw that person whole and then he looked at the crippledness uh, and pulled it up to be like it was supposed to be and he saw everything he ever did before he ever did it <laughs> prophetic ministry has this quality to it and I,
Miles and I were in a Tuesday night service at home, had a guest preacher, Brother Johnson was preaching. He preached on prayer. Holy Ghost came down. We got to praying. In the midst of that, people got to travailing. And um, 10 minutes turned to 20 minutes, and 20 to 30, and 30 to 45, and 45 to an hour, and an hour to two hours, and two hours to three hours. We kept on going. And we all just got in the Holy Ghost. Unspeakably different atmosphere in the place. I remember while I was laying there praying, I said, God, I may lay here three days and never move. No shower, no going home, no changing clothes. The Holy Ghost is here. God, what have I got to do anyway that's more important than what I'm doing? Your presence is here, and what in the world is going to be any more attractive or important to me than your presence? And so, God, why don't you just talk to us? And out of the blue, the Spirit said, go to Bakersfield. Bakersfield's about four hours, four and a half hours away. Said there's a piece of property there that the brethren in California need. And I've got it for them. And it's 100 acres. And I said, uh, well, first, I said, hello. Who are you? And then I said, I don't know. God, <clears throat> am I hallucinating? Hello, God, God. Make sure I'm talking to you and not losing my brain here. And God said, go to Bakersfield. I said, when? He said, go to Bakersfield in the morning. I said, okay. And he said, look at this property. I said, God, I don't know anything about Bakersfield except 99 runs through it and a few hotels I've stayed in. And Holy Ghost said, I'm going to show you where that property is. It's across street from the airport. I said, across street from the airport? I don't know where the airport is. And it's like God got a little ticked. No, I'm telling you the truth. I am not exaggerating. I'm just telling the story. And you all that think I'm crazy, I'm going to give you justification for thinking that before I get through preaching. I said, God, across from the airport? He said, yeah! He said, so people can get in there and get out of there. Speakers can get in there, fly in and go right across the street. People can get in there with their motorhomes and their cars and without getting hung up right off the freeway. Yeah, I mean, the, the attitude was like, are you just stupid? <laughs> I said, okay. I got up. There was 30, 40 people left. Miles and my wife and my daughters and maybe 30 other folks was sitting there. I said, I looked at my wife and I said, we got to go to Bakersfield in the morning. She said, Bakersfield? I mean, Bakersfield is not really known as a resort city. <laughs> and she said, I said, yeah. And I kind of laughed a little bit embarrassed. Oh, these saints are here and they can all hear me. I said, now nothing may come of this. But whether it comes or not, God told me to go to Bakersfield and told me where there's 100 acres and told me to go buy it for the fellowship. And so she said, okay. So we got up the next morning, we drove to Bakersfield. When we got there, I was not real, I mean, I wasn't real jovial. I'm like, God, people know about this. And I'm supposed to be one of their leaders. And if this don't happen, oh well. And my wife about that time said, where do we turn? I said, I don't know. She said, no, really, tell me where we're, I said, I don't know. And so she didn't say anything else. She could tell that the guy had a rotten attitude. <laughs> Finally, we came up the road. I said, turn here. 
she got off. We went down that road. And there was a little airport sign, airport this way. I said, go that way. We went down there, went by the airport. I looked across the street. Behold, this is where it's supposed to be. And I said, that ain't it. <laughs> how did you know it wasn't it? I don't know how I knew it wasn't it. I knew it wasn't it. Prophetically, I knew it wasn't it. And she said, is that it? I said, no, that's not it. She said, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't know. I said, just drive on down the road here. Let's see what happens. We drove on down the road, so help me God. When we get to heaven, you check the record and see if I'm telling the truth. That is, if you make the to heaven after doubting my story. <laughs> we went on down the road. Finally, the further we went, the further the more I knew we're just off. I said, turn around, let's go back. So we went back. We went back by the airport. I looked again, cross street from the airport. Nah, that ain't it. She got back to the freeway. She said, what do you want to do? I said, get on the freeway. I said, go back towards Sacramento. We went up to the next street. I said, turn here. So now we're behind the airport. I said, go down this road. We went down that road. Nothing. Went down it way down, way on down, way out in the middle of nowhere. Nothing. Turned around and came back. She said, well, what do you want me to do now? I said, well, here's a big sign. Said, here's 40 acres for sale right here on the freeway. Let's call. So I called. I said, hello, I'm Nathaniel Wilson. And uh, I'm representing fellowship, and I want you to, I wonder how much this 40 acres is out here. He said, it's $4.4 million. I said, well, why is it so much? <laughs> he said, well, it's zoned. There's a McDonald's going in there. There's a motel going in there. There's a whole bunch of stuff. He said, it's worth every penny. It's really a good deal. He said, what do you want, Dr. Wilson? I said, I want 100 acres. He said, well, uh, he said, there's no 100 acres out there where you're at for sale. I said, yeah, there is. <laughs> I mean, if you're already airborne off the cliff, what difference does it make what you say? said, it's out here. He said, well, how much money you got? I said, $300,000. And he did what you're doing. <laughs> he laughed. He said, I, I don't. He said, Mr. Wilson, I hope you find it. And he said, there's certainly nothing there for $300,000. Actually, I said $360,000. Because I knew that's how much money we had. He said, but if you find it, call me. I'll be glad to sell it to you. I said, it's here. I'll find it. And so I called and drove and looked. And I found it. 103 acres for sale. Got another real estate person, an apostolic person. To call about it. An old man had owned it and he died. It was left to his family. None of them lived in Bakersfield, didn't know, probably didn't even know where the airport was. So I called Brother Frost. I said, Brother Frost, pastor in Bakersfield, I said, come out here. I said, I, there's a, I, I need you to look at this. I, I, there, we got 100 acres here that we can buy for, I think. I said, look, come out here. So he came out there and we drove around. And I said, the only thing, I didn't tell him the whole story because I thought he'd think I was crazier than I already thought I was. And I said, the only thing about this 100 acres, it's behind the airport instead of front of the airport, and it's supposed to be in front of the airport. And he's like, well, he said, if it's supposed to be in front of the airport, let me show you something. And so we drove to the back of the airport. He said, you see that mound of dirt right there? I said, yeah. He said, that's the new terminal, and this is going to now be the front of the airport. Yeah. 
And they since then have built the $55 million terminal. It's open, all that's where all the airplanes go. This property's right across the street. To make a long story longer, we bought it for $300,000. The last I heard, I'm no longer with that fellowship, but the last I heard, they had an offer for 1.8 million for the 103 acres. Doesn't matter to me what they do with it at this point because it's out of my part. I'm just saying you don't do that because you're smart. You only do that if we can get in the Holy Ghost. And so this term, vision, is an inclusive term. And it includes all the work that a prophet did, interestingly. In other words, he had a vision of the whole book. It came in increments. It came in pieces. But... It's a, it's, a, it's a whole thing. All the separate inspirations, all of the visions, they all come together to form a kind of overarching worldview that is given, that is divinely revealed from heaven. And it comes out of, this really sounds kind of new age, but it comes out of an alternative consciousness that is not a part of your everyday life that you can just in your normal third dimension way uh, 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 some way calculate how all of this is going to happen it's impossible it's as far removed uh, as the earth is from heaven you there is no meaning uh, of that kind of thinking and trying to do God's work uh, and the kind of thing I'm talking about that is endemic uh, to a prophetic anointing that if it's not there you're just another lecturer I won't be too much longer, but this leads to the third word of the Bible that describes a prophet from the Old Testament. The word is Massa, M-A-S-S-A. And it's repeatedly associated with prophets. And it means the burden. The burden. Of the word on the man that's why I talked about this being the message bearer it's something that he carries it's not something that is just speaking or just seeing but it's associated with carrying a burden where when that person is ministering in the pulpit, the attraction of it is that everybody consciously or subconsciously is aware that something transcendent has come into the room. Worship erupts out of this. Supernatural miracles erupt out of this. It doesn't have to be some profoundly complicated word but it does have to be an anointed word and it is this that's why the Bible uses terms like the hand of Jehovah it's laid over on the prophet the hand of the Lord was upon me the weight the pressing the hand of the Lord and so he's preaching on Sunday morning, but what you can't see is the hand of the Lord is laying the burden of the Lord. This is not understood much in your typical denominal church. This is not understood in a lot of places where church is a half mile wide but a half inch deep. This is not understood in places that don't get it. That there's something to this that comes out of prayer and that comes out of seeking the face of it and that comes out of hearing and that comes out of experiencing and living the prophetic life is lived before it's spoken. And in the context I'm preaching tonight, you see how adverse it is that your football games and your TV shows and your movies 
how they clash against what I'm preaching tonight. And this is why I have stayed in thousands, thousands of motel rooms by myself. But it's for this reason, not because of a manual, that I've never turned the TV on. When I say that, there are, there are several things that happen. One is immediately people run for cover of self-defense, the first of which is holier than thou. The second is for self-justification and reams of blathering talk about why that's not wrong to do that. And talk is one of only two things in the universe that, is, that touches on the infinite. You can just talk forever, but I'm not going to talk to you about it. If that's in your heart, whatever you do, you do. But you're not going to be a prophetic people if you're filled up with stuff uh, that's trifles uh, and trinkets. Uh. And repeatedly, the Bible likens the burden of the prophet to pregnancy. Isaiah 21, 1 through 3, burden is elaborated in terms of a mother and child birth. I've got to get this off my back. Preacher came and preached one Sunday morning. We raised, we had one Sunday of month in which somebody would preach and it would take a special offering when it was collecting money to build a church. One morning, Brother Young had asked Clifford Clark to come. Clifford Clark, pastor in Ontario, California, he came that morning. He did not come Saturday night. He came Sunday morning. Flew in. Somebody picked him up. He got there just before church. He came to church. He was not friendly. He's a friendly man. He's a good man. He's a godly man. He didn't enjoy the service. I tried to be affable and friendly. There wasn't much response. We introduced him. I think Miles introduced him. He said, I'm going to preach to you today. I'm not staying for lunch. I'm getting on a plane. I've already got my ticket, and I'm going home. And further, I don't want to be here. He said, I wish I wasn't here, but I'm going to tell you what God said, and then I'm leaving, and I can't wait to go. Really good pulpit manners. <laughs> he said, God told me that this church doesn't understand sacrifice, and your ministry speaking of mainly me, not Miles, doesn't understand. And that they have tried to make it easy on you. But I am not pleased that they've tried to make it easy on you. Because it's not about you. It's about my kingdom. And I expect you as people to give everything that is necessary regardless because this world's not your... And he launched on us and ripped us from stem to stern. And when he got through, he closed his Bible and said, that's what God gave me for you, and walked out. And that became a turning point in the Rock Church in terms of intensity, of commitment to get a job done, to build the kind of thing that needed to be built, and to raise the millions of dollars necessary to do it, to, because a man of God with a burden with the hand of the Lord pressing on him. Not some smarmy little hello folks. We want to welcome you into our little party. But it's something that when people feel it. They know they're in a world that cannot be duplicated outside of a prophetic people. I 
Isaiah 42, experience of a mother in travail. Now, this is important. It's uh, the experience. It describes in Isaiah 42 the experience of a mother in travail and ascribes that travail to God himself. Jeremiah feels the travail of his people and feels the birth pangs himself, chapter 4, chapter 6. And Paul says that Christ may be formed in you again. Mary, birth. And so being called of God means that you experience and express the very passions of God. Brother Bean used to say, if you're in the Holy Ghost, when you walk into a service, when you enter the place, when you take the pulpit, whatever you are feeling is what God is feeling. And God is expressing his feelings through you. That's the burden of the Lord. That's the hand of the Lord. But if there's no prayer, and if there's no sensitivity to God, then it's a man up there wandering around trying to figure out, what do I say tonight to keep the natives from being restless? Not only does the prophet deliver the message, he is part of the message. He is the incarnated word. And that's the... That's one of the primary secrets to the book of Jonah. He carries the word of God, but he lacks the passion of God. He is not going to let the passion of God disrupt his comfort level. And so he becomes a rebellious prophet. And that book is written on purpose to show you the sailors are shown at least three times to have passion. And the people of Nineveh are shown at least two or three times to have passion. And the king of Nineveh is shown to have passion. And God is shown to have compassion. And everybody's got passion except Jonah. And his rebellion was not just to deliver the word. It was to accept the burden of the word and go there and show them the passion of God. You don't get a lot of that in your local denominal church. And so the preacher represents the heart of God, the word of God, but he manifests the heart of God. I want to take just a moment. I'm going to skip one of these. I want to take just a moment to talk about The prophet as a madman of the wind. I'm gonna make you gonna make you nervous. Hosea nine and seven says the prophet is a fool. King James says a spiritual man is is mad, but another way of saying that that is even more distinct is the prophet is a fool the man of the spirit is mad the spiritual man the man of the spirit and the reason is is because this was a view when you look through the thread of Israel's history when Jeremiah prophesies when he prophesies to Israel's political leaders that they're going to be taken into captivity to Babylon one of them responds with the word Quote, arrest every madman who prophesies. When prophets came to anoint Jehu to be king, his military colleagues dismissed the prophet as a madman. And there are numerous other examples that time does not permit tonight. But when you say man of the spirit, that's what a prophet is. When you say man of the spirit, and you think of John 3, 8, the spirit blows where it listeth the wind ruach is wind breath spirit in the old testament the man of the spirit is a man of the ruach the wind blows where it listeth no man knows where it comes from and no man knows where it goes and so therefore he appears to be untamed 
and to have untamable energy controlled only by God. And the Spirit sees these people and they get seized into what writers would call an ecstasy that they seemed rather wild, unnatural, abnormal, even crazy in a civilized world. They don't, whatever they get doesn't come by the normal scientific method. We came out of a service one night, I can't even describe it, there was a drunkenness in the Holy Ghost and we were sitting in the office and the Spirit of God and prophecy was in the place. And the only words that I could think of, and others were in there, but the only words I could think of was no limits. No limits. And the Spirit was in no limits. And a conference is named after a spiritual experience, and may it always carry as the burden of that name the Spirit that was there that night. That leaves a lot of people a little bit uneasy and uncertain about the man of God and what he's going to do next. But man of God, that's the edge that has to be lived on if there's going to be a prophetic anointing that people don't always or a lot of the time don't know what is, but they learn. They learn to trust because they feel the presence of the Lord and spiritual people follow and say, I know we're on track. Spirit guides us. Listen to Micah. Chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the jackals and a mourning like the ostriches. King James says, I will make a wailing like the dragons and a mourning is the owl. And Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel. And then there's a long last list of reactions that take place when the gospel he's talking about is preached. And years later, the one that he was a type of comes home to his home church that's the first place to be a prophet and he opens the book to the place where Isaiah the prophet said this is how his ministry starts it doesn't start with all the other stuff that seems so important the spirit of the Lord is upon me and that's how Jesus Christ starts his ministry he hath anointed me and nothing replaces the anointing. The most prominent man that has spiritual experiences in the Old Testament is Ezekiel. And he's also the prophet most known for his erratic and sometimes bizarre behavior. I'm sure I'm making some of you a little nervous. The Bible talking about the prophet said they are carried away by the zeal of the Lord. It's unreasonable zeal. They believe they can do things that are absolutely impossible to do. But they have seen something and there's a hand pressing on them and a burden on them that will break. It'll break the rock in pieces. The word, the word of God is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. <laughs> and I will close with this. You that are being ordained tonight, last of all, the prophet is a dead man. Now the first thing you can think of is that most of the prophets were martyred. And that's, that's true, they were. But there is an Old Testament saying that is repeated in at least five different books. Musicians, 
Would you come? Don't play, just come. It's repeated in at least five different books. This phrase that in one form or another to see God is to die. And so, Brother Elder, we look at that and then we say, well, here it says, Isaiah clearly said, and I think it's in verse 5, he said, and I saw the Lord. He says it in the first verse, and he says it again in the fifth verse. I saw the Lord. In the first verse, he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. But I'd add something to that that Isaiah didn't know in 6 and 1 that he knew later. In the year that King Uzziah died, so did Isaiah. Because you can't see the Lord and live. When someone sees God, prophetic vision, it doesn't mean your life is over in the future. It means your life is over right then. Well, we're going to die someday. Yeah, but, but the, the initiating crisis of death in the life of a prophet is when he sees the Lord. It's at the beginning of his ministry. And there is a convergence of to call and to kill. Where the prophets... Whatever life you had, Hosea, it's gone now, Bubba. Your life has been taken from you. Now, I'm preaching to you tonight what I have found in the Bible, corroborated by the little bit I've seen in life of the power of God. Unless the apostolic movement produces people like I'm preaching about tonight. That make people laugh in derision at first. The prophet doesn't use coercion. The prophet doesn't use, the part I skipped is the prophet is a poet. The, pro, the only way you can talk about the things a prophet talks about is with symbols and words that gesture toward it because what he's seen is bigger than language, which is finite. The prophet speaks in an unknown tongue in more ways than one. And people who are spiritual catch it. And one drop of what I'm preaching about tonight is more powerful than a Nile River of shallow Christianity. And if this comes on our preachers, you don't have to worry about revival. You don't have to worry about holiness. You don't have to worry about sinners coming to the altar. You don't have to worry about being saved. God has entered the building. And carnality has left the building. Would you stand? We're going to ordain these brethren, but <clears throat> before we do that, I'm praying that tonight all of us become re-ordained. Ordained to a spiritual directive from God as he guides us day by day. And as we attempt to fulfill the profile of a prophet.
Let the power 